Well, Canada, it's got free health care. Everybody tells us here in the United States, if you're on the left side of the spectrum, that it's a great place to live. You don't have to worry about paying your medical bills. Something happens to you, you can go to the doctor, and it's all free. It sounds like paradise, like the United States, but better. Well, my next guest who's joining me right now has a bone to pick and with the head of her government, Justin Trudeau. The extension of end-of-life care means, well, you can end your life. That will be extended. The MAID, Canada's Medical Assistance in Dying Program, will begin allowing citizens to be considered eligible for state-sanctioned euthanasia. Joining me now is a political commentator and someone who lived in Canada for a time, but is American, Marie Oakes. Uh, good morning, Marie. Thank you for joining us on the program. Hi, Austin. Thank you for having me on. Yeah. Uh, so obviously, you know, this is the kind of thing that people who are, you know, of our ideological ilk, people who believe in life, liberty, and and property, um, you know, are I think outraged by and justifiably so, Marie. You know, what's your response to the government of Canada doing something like this? Well, with this program, it is the definition of a slippery slope. When this program first came into being, it was super hard to be eligible for. It was, you know, for the terminally ill, people who were about to die. And they've ever since introducing this law, they had to even change the constitution in order for this to be implemented into law because there are some things about healthcare within the constitution. This has just kept and kept and kept growing in eligibility. I even had, you know, a distant relative who recently use this program, you know, a pretty standard old lady, you know, she had a fall one day. She was in the hospital. They found something wrong with her heart. The doctor offered her, you know, this, uh, this program within two days, she was dead. Her family begged her, please don't do it. Please don't do it. She had a good life. She was, you know, in her early eighties, she was still autonomous. She was living in her own apartment. Accident happened. Boom, they find another problem. They don't want to deal with the problem. They basically tell you, hey, your outlook, you know, to see a specialist X amount of months, maybe years, depends on your situation, depends on the specialist you needed to see. For so many Canadians, they know the reality of what this healthcare system is, the wait times that have become, you know, 15 years ago, it wasn't the problems they're facing today. But a lot of Canadians are now choosing to basically have the government kill themselves for themselves instead of, you know, honestly, I understand waiting these wait times and just suffering while you just wait and question, am I going to die anyway? Pretty terrible stuff. If you're just tuning in to the Wake Up America show, I'm speaking to Marie Oakes. She's a political commentator. We're talking about Canada extending their end of life assistance, aka euthanasia, to people who are mentally unwell. Now, to my understanding, you know, if you're mentally unwell, I mean, that's the definition of, you know, needing protection, needing care, right? So when, if, if you're not able to make decisions for yourself, you're in, you know, mental illness, in a sense, you're, you're losing your autonomy. So, I mean, in theory, how could you even make a decision like that? Well, they try to say there's like these safeguards up. Oh, you have to go through a physician. You have to voluntarily ask for it. But in reality, we're seeing reports after reports where it's not even the patient themselves is asking for it. It's actually being presented to them as an option by the doctors. And, you know, you can see me here now. I am currently, even though, meta, you know, the whole uh, uh, being like um, depressed and all this stuff, mental illness is not part of it. I'm a type one diabetic. I am currently eligible for this system. If I so choose to be eligible for this situ for this uh, for this um policy because I'm a type one diabetic, my illness is irreversible. That is currently the eligibility. You don't have to have a fatal illness anymore. Well, my illness is considered fatal. So me right now, I look fine. I could ask the state to kill me. In two days' time, four days' time, it's the only service in Canada that you can get in that quickly of time, Gee, which is Manila. shocking. <laughs> it's shocking. the only thing you can get in a timely matter is to ask to kill yourself because the thing that's different about the hurry up, US, get your and butt back to America. <laughs> she is, she's back. I'm in America. She's, back. she's here. She's here. But, but when I moved to Canada, because I am a type one diabetic, I take my health seriously. I had to look into, you know, how do I get an endocrinologist? How do I get a doctor? 
you know, I was there for six years. I still never got a primary care doctor. After three years, I was able to get an endocrinologist, thankfully. But when I was there, I was doing research. The way in which this government sees its citizens is burdens. The word on the Health Canada website is if you're a type one diabetic or you're someone with like a chronic illness, they label you a burden on the healthcare system. Maybe for other people, that's like shocking to use such negative language as to like someone who actually needs healthcare versus like people who don't really use the healthcare system. They're not considered burdens, but they're the ones filling up the, you know, the emergency rooms because they're, you know, coughing. So, but the people who need it were burdens. And that is how they view the sick in Canada is you are a burden on our healthcare system because you need to use it X amount of times. And we have only X amount of resources and that is dwindling. And there's cases in BC with cancer treatments where they have like, I think it's like 16 oncologists. So many are leaving the field because it's burnout. It's so horrible. Like I feel for these doctors. I also kind of don't like that they would, you know, leave a situation they know is so awful for the patients, but you're seeing like perfectly fine people who are getting, you know, uh, cancer, not being able to get treatment for like eight months at a time where it's like, this is considered like medically dangerous periods of time. And they're still not able to be seen even for first consultation by an oncologist. So they end up suffering. So they have to decide, is it worth the chance of suffering or should I just, you know, medically suicide myself with the government's okay on this? And this is changing the Overton window. I, in my opinion of what is acceptable treatment for people? Because now it's we're in the situation, even after COVID, I've noticed that doctors, you know, people in the medical offices, they kind of just want to not deal with you. If you ever call a doctor's office, it's almost impossible to get an appointment because no one answers the phone or they make all these hurdles to do it, even in the US, where the same thing is happening everywhere else, where they're trying to figure out ways to deal with you less and less and less. And I wouldn't be surprised that this could even come to the U.S. at some point, if it's not already here, maybe in some states it is. Deeply troubling. If you're just tuning in, I'm speaking to Marie Oakes. She is a political commentator talking to us about Canada's uh, assisted suicide program. Uh, you can text the show at 573-319-1586. You know what I'm deeply concerned about? I, and I certainly hope this isn't already the case, Marie, but um, from some of these programs in, in Europe that exist uh, about minors, people who are under the age of 18 being granted access to these programs. That's not currently the case in Canada yet, is it? No, it's not. But I even will venture to say I, I'm not that old. I'm 25. I remember what it was like to be 18, especially having a chronic illness. You know, that was a time when my illness wasn't doing well. I was young. I wasn't managing my diabetes like I should have. And there were times I was like, I can't live like this. There's no way I could live like this. But at the time, that was not an option. It was a new rollout when I was in Canada. It was like, but I did have thoughts of, I don't want to live the rest of my life like that. So when you're 18, even for these 18 year olds, like, especially if you have a mental health problem, I can't imagine this is like acceptable. Even over the age of 18, people say you're an adult. I'm sorry, your mind is you're still not there. It takes till you're like 23, 24 to really kind of have a grasp of who you are. Some people will be different. I know there's outliers, but generally speaking, I think 18 is like very crazy to be making these sort of decisions of literally not living anymore. I think mm. it's, I think with suicide, you should make it as hard as possible. Someone has, like, you can't ask the government to do it for you. It makes it way too easy. If you really don't want to live, now, I've had friends who have committed suicide. It's not pretty. It's not easy. It's hard. And I think that's kind of the way we should go about this because we don't want people just offing themselves because maybe they're not in the right mental health space for a few years. I'm sorry, when you're 18, you're kind of still, when you're young, you just don't really understand who you are. In general, you are more susceptible of not seeing why life is valuable. Mm, th this is really good stuff. We're speaking to Marie Oakes uh, about Canada's uh, euthanasia program. Um, I wanted to switch just a little bit to a related topic. You sent me a thread this morning from an Andrea Wu, who was telling a story about an otherwise healthy man in his early 40s who was diagnosed with metastatic pancreatic cancer, waited eight weeks for a first consult and died three days later. So, well, uh, 
I mean, if he had gotten in, at least it would have been free, Marie. But this is kind of an example of what we're talking about here, about how the, the healthcare system, it might be free, but you, if you can't see a doctor, it doesn't matter, does it? No, it absolutely does not. Like, personally, I'm still on a wait list, even though I'm not in Canada, because once you're on a wait list, you can't even take yourself off to, like, make room for someone else, technically. So that's just how it is, is once you're on a wait list, you don't know how long you're going to be on it. It's not digitized. You don't know what space you're in. You don't even know if your your referral has been lost. So you're just like in a waiting game, hoping that you'll receive a letter in the mail that says, your doctor is this, your appointment date is this. You barely even have like decision over your appointment date because you will just take whatever you can get. And I'm coming from Quebec. That's where I was living. So it's a much different situation. Every province is a bit different. Quebec's kind of one of the worst. So I was in the worst of the worst. I saw the worst of the worst this system can produce. You know, once I went to the emergency room, I was there for 26 hours. And then I had to come back again because they were like, you're not going to be seen. Like, come back tomorrow. You're still in line. And that was like a big wake up call for me when I would talk to people about this, they would tell me I'm lying. And I would tell like my friends in America and they'd be like, oh, I have a family member in Ontario. Or, oh, I have a family member in Alberta. It's not the same situation there. It's like, yes, the healthcare system is different everywhere you go, every hospital. So depending where you are, but right now, overall situation in Canada, every politician in Canada is finally talking about it, but like it's your guys' fault because you guys run it. They're all saying, the healthcare system's falling. It's falling. COVID like really destroyed people's confidence in the Canadian healthcare system because the veil was lifted. Mm. Uh, Marie Oaks, um, you can follow her online. Marie, where can people follow you online to learn more about your work as a political commentator? Uh, you can find me basically everywhere at the Marie Oaks at you know basically Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. I'm everywhere right now. Now I even have a telegram. That's a really good place as well. So and, just and like can, look me up. And you can see how her name is spelled right underneath her lovely picture there on the live stream this morning. Marie, thank you very much for your time today. We're very grateful for you. That was a great report.